Well, we have been reflecting on the scripture, 2 Corinthians 5.18, where uh, Paul, writing to us, says that we have been given a ministry of reconciliation. Now, if that's our ministry, in order to operate it, we need to understand the process of reconciliation, right? And what, what was interesting to me when I began thinking about this early in my ministry is how little we talk about it. But, uh, but I do, and here we are. When we talk about reconciliation, we're talking about taking a relationship that has been strained and or broken and returning it to its former level of love and trust. Now, we're not returning it to where it was before, because where it was before, strained and broke the relationship. But we can love as we did. Uh, we can trust as we did. Um, the process that we're talking about, the model, is that on the part of the person who is the offender, that they have to confess and they have to repent. And on the part of the offended, they have to forgive and they have to allow the offender to rebuild the trust that was broken. So, that's where we are. Well, we've talked about the offender for the last couple of Sundays. Today we're going to shift and we're going to talk about the offended. And we are going to talk about forgiveness. Now, <clears throat> let me just start here and just give a bit of introduction. Forgiveness is the most difficult uh, to understand, to operate, whatever, of the four elements of of uh, uh, reconciliation. Now, the reason for that is that there are there is an intellectual and there is an emotional component with the offense and with the forgiveness. Right? When somebody hurts, you're not only hurting, you know, physically in your head or whatever, but your heart has been wounded, and so there is an intellectual and there is an emotional part. And usually, in order to heal from all that, it takes time and distance. Let's talk, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a broad overview, and then we're going to deal with some detail, and next week we'll deal in more detail. Okay? Um, forgiveness is both a decision and a healing process. You need to understand, it, it's more than just a decision. It's a decision and a healing process. Now, even after we choose to forgive, we may continue to experience anger. And this causes us to question, did I really forgive? Okay? Remember, we talked about head, we talked about heart. Um, when we start talking about forgiveness, it must. Forgiveness is not just saying, oh, it's okay. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness has to address the issues of justice, restitution, and satisfaction. It has to deal with all of those. Otherwise, what happens is, as you smooth it over, nothing really happens and we just kind of put on fake smiles and walk around each other. One of the problems that I have with the way most uh, forgiveness is dealt with in the pulpits is that um, if we are taught that the offender, and it does, and it does happen, but the offender gets off scot-free and the offended picks up the check. Well, that is true. But that's not the whole story. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, when the, it's also taught that when the offended forgives, he goes in, he prays, he forgives, and he has this wave of glory just overwhelms them, and they go off happy-go-lucky, ain't true. 
It doesn't work that way. Um, and that's why we have to deal with these things and deal with some of the, the different things that are going on. Um, second thing, and this is, this is really the insight that started this whole series. Just because we forgive doesn't mean we want to reconcile. Now, forgiveness is an option, but reconciliation is the decision of two people, not one. And I can tell you, some people have done some things for me that, frankly, they've been forgiven a long time, don't think about it, whatever, but I don't care if I ever see them again. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Oh, you're a Christian preacher. You ought to just be able to be around. I don't want to be around them every time I get around them. They hurt me. Right. You know, I, I'll tell you what. Even a child, when they touch a stove and they get burned, they never touch it again. <laughs> you know, do I look stupid? Don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> but forgiveness does not assume... But what happens is, you get you take a look at most of the preaching on forgiveness. Preacher comes through and, well, we're going to go through here, and you do that, and, and he forgave, and they melted together at the altar, and everything was just fine. Uh-uh. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. It may preach good, but it, it's hard to live. <laughs> the granting of forgiveness doesn't mean that the offender, the offended wants to reconcile. You know, not only does I assume, but it doesn't mean you want to. Okay, so we need to understand that that there's some choices involved. Okay, let's take some time and talk about what forgiveness is and what it's not. As I mentioned, first and foremost, forgiveness is a decision. You choose to forgive. Okay? We need to keep that very much in mind because it is intentional. We choose to forgive. When we choose, what we choose is we choose to release an offender from all the material, spiritual, and emotional damage incurred by that fashion. You owe me nothing. It's gone. Okay? You cancel the debt. Now, when you forgive, you must cancel the debt of you. It may be a debt of love. It may be a, a debt of a material debt. Uh, it may be pain. It may be anything. But when you <coughs> forgive, cancel the debt. It's gone. Okay? This is the tough one. This is one of the reasons why forgiveness is so hard. The offender has to pay the cost of forgiving. And it is usually quite high. It may be emotional. It may be physical. Remember, uh, when I was uh, back in Newark, one of the families in the church had their house broken into and robbed. And when they were there, they took, you know, some pretty valuable heirlooms and stuff like that. And I was talking with the lady afterwards, and she said, you know, John, I just felt like they took everything of mine. And, and I have nothing. And yet, in order to forgive the people that robbed her house, She's got to bear that loss. The silver, the china, you know, you got to bear it. It's not easy. It's not easy. You have to pay the cost. Furthermore, you got to give up revenge. Now, what happens is when we get hurt, we want to hurt back. We want them to hurt just as badly as we hurt. And so what we do is, is we begin doing things and we try and bring revenge. But revenge doesn't even the score, it just makes things worse. And so, we have to give up revenge. 
We have to give up the right to hurt them back in any way. Gossip about them. Put them in the worst light we possibly can. Wish them evil. Give it up. If you're going to forgive, you've got to get rid of it. And we have to cease hating. Okay? Again, another hard thing. When you hate somebody, you intend them evil. Okay? You intend them evil. We have to give that up. Furthermore, not only do we cease hating, we have to treat them with loving behavior. We want to do what's right, what's best. Okay? Wow. Pastor, you're saying forgiveness is tough. Yep. We're going to talk a lot about that next week. But we need to understand, and you need to know from the get-go, here's what forgiveness means. I, in my opinion, probably the most difficult issue for the offended is that the offender is spared the just consequences of their hurtful behavior. Someone else, usually the offender, picks up the tab. Well, it looks like they're getting off. Okay? You gotta deal with that. However, Lewis Smedes writes, we can believe in forgiveness only if justice is maintained and guilt is confirmed. I'm not letting people off the hook. That's not what forgiveness is. Desmond Tutu said this, forgiveness is not pretending that things are other than they are. And finally, Enright North in their book says, forgiveness is taking seriously the awfulness of what has happened when you are treated unfairly. Am I making some things clear here? Forgiveness isn't just saying, I'll oh, forget it. That's not forgiveness. That's not forgiveness. The offender is not pardoned in the sense that the consequences of this sin is dismissed. Pardon. Furthermore, we got to understand this. Again, so much talking about how happy you'll be and whatever. The offended may not be happy about forgiving. Come on. Think about it. Think some of the things that have been happening. Have you been, oh, bless God, I get the opportunity to forgive. Oh, come on. Give me a break. <laughs> come on. We need to understand that we may not be happy about forgiving. Furthermore, we may not want to reconcile. I realize we're talking about reconciliation, but we've got to live in a real world. And there are hurts that can happen to us that we, that we have to forgive, but we don't have to go back for another round. <laughs> Okay. With forgiveness, justice, satis justice is satisfied, but the price is paid by another. This is an interesting scripture. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. <clears throat> He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. <coughs> What's he talking about there? I believe basic Christianity says that it doesn't matter what you do, if you will confess and repent, 
God will forgive you. Is that basic theology? <clears throat> Swallow that one if they murdered your child. Come on. We need to understand that this is a, this is a whole lot deeper than we think. Now, what he's saying here is that God is a God of mercy and he wants to forgive and he does not wish, his first choice is not to put the, uh, uh, to, to send the offender and punish them. His first choice is he wants to have mercy. And so what happened? Jesus died on a cross for our sins. He picked up the check. Now when you begin to think of how Jesus was tortured to death, beaten, mocked, hung on a cross, strung out, when you begin to see all of that and you begin to put it together, now you begin to understand how that Jesus died for the most heinous sins that human beings have committed. Right? Okay. Now, but, so God had to be fair in forgiving our sins. And so Jesus picked up the check. If that doesn't cause you to love Jesus deeply in your heart, one of two things has happened. You've never thought seriously about going to hell for eternity. Okay? Or you uh, are just not thinking at all. Jesus died so that I didn't have to spend eternity in hell. My, my, oh my, oh my! That ought to cause all kind of love to build up in your heart. You need to think about that. Jesus died on a cross in our place so that God could justly forgive us and not consign us to eternal damnation. However, our salvation is dependent upon our confession and repentance. God didn't just say, oh, I'll forget it. No, Ellie's got to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I did this, it was wrong, I'm sorry, and by your grace, I'll never do it again. Amen. See, unless you get that, salvation is worthless. You just back out, bring more sin and whatever. There has to be confession and repentance. Let's talk about some sources of justice. There are three primary sources of justice. Now, what we have to understand, remember we're talking about in order to forgive, we can't dismiss justice. We've got to deal with it. Okay? First of all, we can get justice from the offender, and we'll call this horizontal justice, or we can get it from the governing authorities, or... Or we can get it directly from God. Okay? Let's, let's spend a little time on this. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus says this, If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times and comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Okay? First of all, this is a conversation between two people. Bert and I. You know, we're having a conversation here. And let's say I did something stupid and Bert comes to me and says, Pastor, that wasn't right. Okay? Rebuke him. Okay? Wasn't right. And if he says, I repent. Now that is a promise, when I say I repent, 
That is a, 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 an admission of the wrong and a, and, a, and a commitment to change. Right? He said, what? Forgive me. What if he says, I'm sorry? Uh-oh. They didn't promise anything. In fact, when they say, I'm sorry, I say, you know, <clears throat> what I'm really sorry for is that you're so overly sensitive. <laughs> Come on. Come on. I'm sorry I got caught. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, come on. We're, what we're talking about here is, is between two people, and it's conditioned upon the offender's declaration of, uh, of, uh, of repentance. Now, here's the part that gets tough in this scripture, um, is that he says, if he does it seven times, still forgive. <laughs> well, you know, I'm still human. <laughs> But that's what Jesus said. But notice, it was a promise to reform. Okay? Let's talk about governmental justice. What we're talking about now is when something happens, we have the right to appeal to those in authority over us. For example, we're most familiar with civil and criminal law. Uh, someone does something, uh, we go to uh, the police or... Uh, whatever, we go before a judge, judge settles things, um, and that is, to the best of their ability, that's justice, okay? Probate court, probably one of the best examples in this stuff, where a family is squabbling over how the household things are to be divided, and we end up in probate court, and the judge says, this is this and this and this, and that's justice, period. Now, you may not like it, but the government entity does that. Now, uh, on the other hand, don't forget that that would also include like uh, parents, uh, church leaders, supervisors, those kind of people we have the right to appeal when we've been offended uh, in those particular uh, situations. The problem with governmental uh, justice though is it can't heal the hurts. You can't heal hurts through the exercise of authority. It just won't work. Oftentimes it even makes it worse. Furthermore, justice may be limited for human beings, or it can even be perverted. So uh, that's where we are. <clears throat> Let's talk about vertical justice. Jesus is saying again, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, and so, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Okay? Now notice, this is a conversation between the offended and God. Okay? You're praying. Okay? Furthermore, keep in mind, God is the moral governor of the universe. He has a, responsi a responsibility to do something about it. Now we forgive because we are forgiven. Notice, forgive, so that your Father will forgive you. In faith, what we do when we forgive, we turn that fairness issue over to God. Okay? We turn that issue over to God. Let me back up. A quick story is important here. Years ago, uh, I took over a congregation and the pastor had been forced to retire and uh, to those who were around it was obvious why he was forced. He, was, uh, he had a way of saying good morning and you'd want to punch him in the face. Okay. <laughs> he broke into my office, took my diary made copies of it, and was passing it around the congregation. I was angry. <laughs> and I did what Matthew 18 does. says, uh, uh, Pastor, uh, I brought him in my office, and I said, Brother Pastor, 
you offended me when you took my diary and made copies and was passed around. Direct quote. Well, Brother Miller, what I did may not have been wise, but it wasn't sin. What? People only go to jail for breaking and entering. Honest to God. Honest to God. Well, I uh, was angry, deeply angry, uh, seething angry, and the truth is, in addition to all this, he had harassed me, harassed the congregation, and I reached a point, this is not an exaggeration, I reached a point that I could, I, I could have killed him and felt good. <laughs> now, I'm not exaggerating. I, I don't say that proudly. But I understand how domestic murders happen. I understand. And it scared me. <coughs> I'd went to my I went to my prayer closet and I prayed, Dear Jesus, please take the anger away. Take the anger away. I come out 45 minutes later and I was more angry than one of the way in. Finally I went forward, I said, Lord, this isn't working. And he said, you're not praying in faith. <coughs> what? No. Remember, vengeance is mine, I'll repay. Now you either believe that or you don't. I said, Jesus, I really believe that. I went back into my prayer closet and I said, Father, I honestly believe that you're going to give me justice in this. You said you were going to do it. I don't know when, I don't know how, but you're going to do it. And this is the honest to God truth. I literally felt the anger drain out of me. Amen. Okay? Went out of a prayer closet. About 15 minutes later, I was seated. I had to go back into the prayer closet, and I had to reassert that uh, regularly. Uh, over time, but every time I reasserted it, it came, uh, it, it, there was longer and longer periods until finally uh, I was over my anger. Okay? So, this is what we're talking about, about turning that fairness issue over to God. Now, one of the things that he says here is do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge. <coughs> I will repay, says the Lord. Amen. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. He said leave room for God's wrath. God saw what happened. He took note. He's angry. But he's also not on our times. <laughs> <laughs> leave room for God's wrath. Don't you get in there. You let God's wrath come. I'll tell you something, when God does it, a lot of people get a lot of help. <laughs> okay? God has promised vengeance. Vengeance is justice administered by a legitimate authority. Okay? What the courts bring is vengeance. They are duly constituted to bring punishment, whatever, and to settle scores. Revenge, on the other hand, is punishment administered by the individual. Okay? You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. That's revenge. And when, when we do that, uh, vengeance is future. So we take faith in God's promise. We don't know whether it's going to happen in the next 20 minutes or the great white throne judgment. But it's come. It's come. Here's the problem. The heart is slower than the mind. Now we may need to assert our faith many times before our heart catches up with our head. Okay? That's something that we really don't pay attention to, is how that our hearts can hurt. And we can make our decision to forgive, but <laughs> the heart's not there yet. And it takes time to get it there. Finally, uh, the decision to forgive starts a healing process. 
Psychologists and theologians agree on this point. Okay? Without forgiveness, you'll never heal. Okay? And I don't care whether it's a psychologist or a the theologian, they're totally agreed on that point. Now, I can also tell you there are several models that have been proposed about how a person goes through a healing process. And what was interesting to me is, is none of them were remotely the same, uh, which, which brought me to the conclusion is that the process we go through will probably be pretty much individual. Uh, you will deal with it in your way uh, that you do. However, there are some milestones that we can talk about. Number one, it takes time. Two, it starts with a decision to forgive. Three, the hurtful uh, behavior must stop or healing is impossible. I learned this, uh, that preacher was in the congregation. God finally moved him eight hours away. Uh, after he moved, I healed, but not until then. This is one of the problems that we run into when there's conflict in the home. Because what happens, the hurting doesn't stop. And until the hurting stops, you can't heal. So, uh, the hurtful behavior has to stop. <clears throat> when it does, it ends when the forgiver is at peace. Now, I want to say something here. We'll probably deal with it a lot more next Sunday. The forgiver remembers the experience, but does not relive it. You can't forgive something like that. It's a major thing in your life. But when you come up against the triggers, you don't relive it, your gut doesn't shake, your, uh, you, you get all angry and whatever again. You're at peace. You've accepted it. Well, we're here. Let's conclude. Forgiveness is a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. Forgive them, not because they deserve it, but because God requires it of us. Somebody hurt you? You've been wounded deeply. Somebody pulled your guts out, handed them back to you. I'm convinced that until those kind of things happen, we really do not understand the cross of Jesus Christ. We do not understand what it means when he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Forgive in faith. Faith that God will do what's right and just. He made us a promise. And he will always keep his word. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to reconcile, we must forgive. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, we thank you for what you've done for us. Father, we want to thank you that you modeled forgiveness for us. You took it uh, to the absolute extreme, and yet you forgave. Now, Father, as we, as a congregation, gather here, and as we begin to take communion. Lord, this is about forgiveness. And we ask that the means of grace would be ours today. Help us.